Dear Lord, we just thank you for the truth of your word. For those that are going and sharing the gospel, Lord, that Jesus has died and taken away the sins. We are able to accept him in our hearts, Lord. He has raised, risen and conquered death, Lord, and we can eternally walk with him. Yeah, free of all this pain and all of the, the misery that we see around us, the strife, the arguing, the just debating on things we don't even know, Lord. But uh, you give us a clean hope in what is pure and truthful and right. And uh, we just thank you for that message going out in church today. And I just ask that uh, those that are coming in here, Lord, those that hear this online, through the radios, Lord, that, that you will work to soften our hearts. That the words that we hear today will penetrate our actions and our commitment to be in relationship with you. And I just ask these things in your name. Amen. Please stand and read uh, God's word with me. Uh, Psalm 143.7 Answer me speedily, O Lord. My spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me. Lest I be like those who go down into the pit. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. For in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift up my soul to you. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you I take shelter. Teach me to do your will. For you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Revive me, O Lord, for your name's sake. For your righteousness' sake. Bring my soul out of trouble. In your mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all those who afflict my soul, for I am your servant. Amen. Do we transition into worship here? <laughs> Good morning. How are you guys? All right, let's pray and start some worship here. Um, Jesus, again, we just love you. Thank you for bringing us all here. And I just pray that you would uh, just draw our hearts um, to you. And uh, just pray that you would be blessed by our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. <clears throat> Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever 
ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I can be seated for a minute. We've got some announcements. <clears throat> My guitar's not on. That's the first one. <laughs> you guys sounded great. <laughs> okay. Um, so first one, uh, corporate prayer today at 1.30 in here. So if you guys want to join. Um, stick around. Uh, safety team meeting next Sunday right after church for individuals who want to be a part of the team. Um, text Kyle if you want to. Uh, his info is in the bulletin. And if you can make it for a head count for lunch. Um, so for Easter, we decided to keep the potluck here. So join us after service Easter Sunday, and the church will provide uh, ham and rolls, last names A through N, bring a side dish, O through Z, bring a dessert. For Eat, Study, Pray this Thursday, uh, sign up in the back if you would like to join us. So that's it. Do you guys want to stand or you want to sit for worship? I'll just play loud. <laughs> Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, cover songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnets, sung by flaming tongues. 
sons of birth. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of God's unchanging love. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I've come. Safely to arrive at home. Jesus sent me when a stranger wandered from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger. Interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor. Daily I come straight to thee. Let thy grace now like a feather. Find my wandering heart to thee. From to wander on a feeling. From to reap the God. Here's my heart all taken seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnets, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it. Mount of God's own. Approach my soul, the mercy seat, where holy one and helpless meet. There fall before my judge's feet, thy promise is my only plea, O God. Send wings to lift the clutch of sin, you who dwell between the cherubim. The war without and fear within, relieve the grief from the shoulders of crumbling men. O God, pour out your mercy to me. Striking love to bleed. Fashion my heart in your alchemy with the brass to front the devil's perjury. In surefire grace, my Jesus speaks. I must, I will not. To believe, O oh God, O oh God, pour out your mercy to me. My God, oh, what striking love 
to bleed. Oh God, pour out your mercy to me. My God, oh, what's striking up to Approach my soul, the mercy seat, where holy one, helpless meet. There fall before my judge's feet, thy promise is my only plea, O oh God. Bring your worry, grief, and pain. Every cause you have for shame, lay it all down. Lay it all down. When your cares have buried you, when there's nothing left to do, lay it all down. Lay it all down at the feet. Something went wrong there. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to try it again. <laughs> Can't explain 
There's nothing here I can ease the pain. Lay it all down. Lay it all down at the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. Lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down, lay it all down. At the feet of Jesus. At the feet of Jesus. the feet of Jesus. Why should I feel discouraged Why should the shadows come And why should my heart be lonely Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he, his eye is on He watches over me, and I sing because I'm happy, and I sing because I'm free. His And I know he watches over me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, songs give ways to sigh when home within me dies I draw closer to him From care he sets me free, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches over me. And I see because I'm happy. And I see because I'm free. His eye is on the spell.
watches over me. Thank you, Jesus. Um, thank you that you watch over us every second. And um, thank you that we can, there's just nothing that we can't bring to you, nothing that you wouldn't forgive us for. And just thank you for being our best friend. We love you. And just pray that you would bless everyone here today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, if Jamie has an announcement. <laughs> So I just wanted to make a quick um, Sunday school announcement and just kind of update you on some changes that we've made with our um, with our check-in system. And actually, they'll be starting next week, so just be looking for that. Um, first through eighth grade checks in in the bookstore and the nursery checks in in the nursery. But um, instead of having the clips like we've done, we will have um, name tapes, tag stickers that are disposable. What happens with the, the clips is they just end up getting lost and stuck in people's cars. So <laughs> it'll just make it simpler. Um, so just be looking for that. You'll put your, your child's name on, on each. And, and really, as far as the check-in part, I'm okay with kids checking themselves in. However, on the, out on the checkout part, we've gotten a little lax. So I am gonna ask parents to please check your kids out. It's not, um, it just isn't okay for us to have kids checking kids out. So we just need to have some consistency with that. Um, one thing we are going to do with the old, with the um, first through eighth grade who are in the other building is when we get down to just a couple of kids, we will be bringing them over and we'll be in the bookstore. We aren't going to come over and just release them because we can't keep track of if they made it to their parents. So um, if, if, you're, if you're running late getting over, check the bookstore. We may be in there. Um, and you can you can you can retrieve them there. So um, the other thing that I want us to just be aware of is the parking lot, and that's we've talked about it before. Um, but the parking lot is probably one of our most dangerous areas with our kids, especially after church. So we do have cones set up. So kids, just remember, even if you're not with your Sunday school teacher, if you're going back and forth, please stay on the on the right side of the cones, okay? It's really important when people are backing out, it's just hard to see you guys sometimes. And so um, parents, just remind your kids of that and kids, you you help each other too, okay? So we all need to be walking walking on the right side of those cones. Those are the biggest things. I just wanna thank, we ha thank our Sunday school workers and our nursery workers. We have some, some great people who are teaching our kids and investing there and it's an awesome thing. And it's a, um, it's really a whole family thing because it affects, like my husband sits alone. There's others of you whose spouses maybe are sitting alone those weeks when your, when your um, spouse is teaching. So thank you too. But it's a great, it's a great thing um, to be, so important to be teaching our kids and raising them up. So thank you for that. All right. Children. Good morning. Good morning. It's T minus seven hours until my wife gets back. Um, I was uh, I was supposed to actually add Jamie's announcement. I purposed in my heart to announce, put it on the announcements that she was supposed to come up and talk. I'd forgotten all about it. Had my helpmate not left me, I would. It, I'm blaming her. So, but she'll be back in seven hours. Thank the Lord. Um, so I'm just glad I got here on time. You know, I realize when church starts, those kind of things. Um, so I'm just glad I'm here. And, and I bring all three of my boys. They're all with me. Well, at least, and hopefully they they all go home with me too. So with that, we are going to finish up Jeremiah 20 this morning. Yes, turmoil. Ministry, turmoil. No, it's not what I just went through, what I've gone through the last couple of days. No. Um, 
No, it's this section. And so the last few chapters we have talked about, we kind of used the pottery theme, and God through that basically described that he's in charge, he's the potter, and the man's response can either be that he conforms to the world, or he can be transformed by allowing God to work in his life. And then last week, we went to Jeremiah 19, and Jeremiah gave an illustration by breaking a jar in the Valley of Hinnom, representing the fact that Judah and his their people would not repent. And because of that, God was going to do to them as he Jeremiah did with the jar, and they were going to be broken and led astray. But with that, then we go into the last of Jeremiah's complaints or maybe his confessions. He's had six of them starting from chapter 11 um, where we, we get a kind of inside glimpse at a conversation that Jeremiah has with God. And um, a lot of mood change changes in this. As we walk through this, you'll realize but there is some application even to us. Um, and we know and have described that Jeremiah's call was that of a really, really tough call on his life. And he started at a young age, and he was basically preaching to the downfall of his nation, of his people. Um, and they would not listen. And we're basically in the middle of his 25, well, kind of on the first half of his 25 messages that he gives to Judah. We're in his eighth message now, and all he's wanting for them is to turn. But we then get, like I said today, we'll get that insight on a conversation that he and God had. And so with that, we're going to read some, and then we'll pray, and we'll go through this. Um, Jeremiah, let's start in verse 7, Jeremiah 20. And we'll read, let's say, 2.13. It says, O Lord, you induced me, and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I, and I, ha and I have, and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. But when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted, violence and plunder, because the word of the Lord was made to me, a reproach and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not, for I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they say, and when we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty awesome one. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But O Lord of hosts you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart let me see your vengeance on them. For I have pleaded my cause before you sing to the Lord, praise the Lord for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of the evil doers. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you. Uh, some of us can relate just to uh, sometimes just our changing emotions based on circumstances or just tough times in life. Lord, as Jeremiah, as you've called him, has to deal with a, a people that were unwilling to turn. Lord, yet in the midst of this, he went to you. And Lord, I, I just like what you uh, show us here, I just ask that you would speak to us that, like Jamie said earlier, that we can always go to you with anything and you will forgive us. Lord, just ask that we would be this real with you, even in our own hearts, Lord, and knowing that you're a good good father. 
Lord, just ask that you would speak to us. as We go through your word and ask this in Jesus' name. We all say, amen. Amen. So, again, he's had six of these confessions, six of these complaints. Uh, when I talk about turmoil in ministry, um, I always think of what the late, now I'm going to forget his name. Um, it'll come to me. Uh, Chuck Missler. Chuck Missler used to, um, when he would present, he would ask uh, basically the crowd, the people before him, how many of you are in ministry? And um, you'd have three or four people raise their hand because their idea, the connotation, their understanding of that was they're getting paid to do some type of ministry in the community, whether through a church or a nonprofit or those kind of things. But what he made us realize that as Christians, any one of us, we're all in the ministry, every single one of us, whether it's in your where you're employed, whether it's um, your family, God has a calling on your life, and he wants you to minister in that calling. He wants you to minister. The idea of ministry is just the idea of serving. And Jesus is no is the greatest example. Remember what he said in Mark 10, 45, really the theme of the book of Mark. He said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and give my life a ransom to the many. And so with that being said, this, again, can relate to us because um, ministry, serving, individuals sometimes is not the easiest thing to do and i know for the most part none of us have ever gone through physical harm in serving and if you have come share with me no i just can i don't know but um it's kind of cool but uh we do know that um there is persecution the bible is clear that it, if we are to live godly we will suffer persecution and jeremiah again is kind of having this moment with the Lord where he's done. And you'll see that as we walk through this. Um, the first thing you see is his struggle with his calling. And unfortunately, he accuses God. These accusations he brings to God. And he says, you know, you induced me. That's the idea of being enticed, persuaded. You persuaded me into this. Almost the idea of you, you deceived me. Like, you didn't tell me it was going to be this rough. Um, the actual word is used for seduction earlier on, earlier on in the Old Testament, the same word. And he said, not only did you kind of trick me into this, uh, he goes, you, sh you strong-armed me, you bolded me. Um, and again, he's bringing these accusations against the Lord. Remember as we went through Jeremiah 1, God had warned him that these people will fight against you. The kings, the princes, the priests, the people. And we just come off of chapter 20 where um, Pasher, the second in charge to the priest, basically put him in stocks. Um, and he was basically put in an open display that people could mock and laugh at him. Um, and so with that, he comes off of that, but he's warned of this. And then he brings his second accusation is, can you change the message that I have to deliver? Because all he says is, all I'm shouting at them with, what I'm speaking, what I'm crying out, is violence and plunder. Violence and plunder. And we've gone. You guys have gone with me through Jeremiah. That's kind of the message that he keeps on bringing to them, is judgments coming because they would not return. But in the midst of all those he does forget that he provides hope. Um, God has used Jeremiah to tell these people that if they would turn back to him, they would and could have a relationship and with him. And he actually would turn back the judgment on the people of Judah. But again, he accuses God. He says these people don't want to take my message seriously. They don't want to hear it. I know at this point, Jeremiah's like, why don't, can I just teach something on comfort? Um, you know, how to be a better person, those kind of messages. And yet what God has given him is this message in order to try to reach these people. 
and it's a hard message. And because of this hard message, it's bought, brought on him, it says, daily derision, daily mockings. Um, so the pain wasn't, not, pain wasn't only physical, but it was emotionally. You became a laughingstock, um, and you can imagine. And I think of Ezekiel and all the things he had to do, all the weird things that he had to do in his ministry. Um, yet here Jeremiah has to bring these harsh words, and because of it, people don't want to hear him. And you can imagine that. Uh, I don't know about you, but there are individuals in my life that I continually want to share with. And yet, they don't want to hear it anymore. Um, and yet, um, I haven't openly got mocked when I'm thinking about the individuals that I've talked to. But again, some of that rejection comes because, again, God's convicting their heart and they don't want to hear it from you. Um, and with that, he goes on to basically threaten God that I'm going to abandon this call that you've given me. I'm done. I will not, he says, make mention of his, him or speak his name. And again, he can rationalize this. He's like, I just want to protect my own skin. You've seen what I've gone through. You've seen the open mockings and all those things. And he says, this is happening again daily to me. And again... When I get to this verse, it is probably my favorite verse in the book of Jeremiah, this verse 9. But it says his word, but his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Um, but his word. Um, he wanted to give up, but he couldn't. Here's the dilemma. If he kept on giving these sermons, he kept on speaking into these people's lives, he was going to receive abuse. And it would get worse for him. Uh, we jokingly said, you know, cheer up. It's only going to get worse. Right? That's from, <laughs> that's from Jeremiah 12.5 where it says, If racing against mere man makes you tired, how will you race against horses? And that's just telling you the ministry is going to amp up. If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickets near the Jordan? And again, sharing with Jeremiah that it was going to get worse for him. But his word. And he knew at that point not to speak. He would lose his peace. In John 16, 33, um, kind of a comforting verse. It says, uh, I didn't write this down, but it, is it 1633? Hopefully, huh? Um, I don't know what side of the page it's on. Sorry. The things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And here his dilemma was... If he did not speak, he would lose his peace. If he continued to speak, he would receive abuse. But he says this word, but his word was in my bones. It had become a part of him. And, um, and he did not want to hold it back. He was weary of holding it back. Um, I think of that consuming fire, that song. I won't sing it for you. I wanted to just right there break out, but um, that would be bad for all of you. Um, but uh, make a joyful noise to the Lord, right? But um, not in front of you guys. And all that to say, you know, it became a part of him. And, and when I think of but his word, I just think of even in my life, how God has transformed my life completely my way of thinking. Um, he's forgiven me for the, all the crazy stuff I've done. Um, you know, from the age of 15 to 25, and you guys have heard my testimony, um, I was the partier. I was the alcoholic. I was the um, um, 
drugs and all those things that were included in my life. Um, and what God did brought his word into my life and made me realize that I could have a relationship with our creator. And his word has been um, changing and transforming my life ever since. And, and I think Jeremiah is reflecting on that. But his word, what has his word done? Even though he's bringing this harsh message, it is the only message that we need to bring to this dying world. This world around us is dying. It does not have a relationship that Christ wants with each and every individual. And we get to bring that message. Here, he's talking to a people that know that a God exists. They have a history of all the things that God has done for Israel, and yet they have abandoned him and gone after other idols. And because it because of his word, it was in his heart, in his bones. He was weary of holding it back. He was getting, trying to get his people to turn back. I, I think of the passage um, in the book of John where basically at one point Jesus kind of has some hard sayings. And a lot of people in that passage in John 6, um, you want to turn there, but John 6, a lot of people reject Jesus for the hard saints. They can't understand what's going on with him. And what he does at that point, he turns to his 12 and looks at them and asks them the questions. Are you going to also reject me? And one of my favorite passages, because what uh, Peter's response. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And never forget that. Um, ministry gets hard. Things get hard. Um, sin happens in this world. Tragedies happen in our lives. People around us, sins affected their lives. And it just bleeds into our lives. Even our own sin has consequences. Those kind of things. But remember, um, God has the words of eternal life. We can not only have a life with him now in this present age, but we get to spend eternity with him. Never let someone or something or some circumstance rob you of that. And he goes on to say, also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And I just love that. When things get tough, to turn to that passage, um, you know, where else can we go? Um, we need to have that mindset. Uh, with that, he then, um, well, well, when I think of the words of eternal life, then again, that's the gospel, and for us as believers, and what's the gospel? That Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures died on a cross for us. And three days later, he was raised. And because of that, we can believe in everything he said. And because of that, we can have eternal life with him if we believe and turn to him. But with that message, you know, we call it good news because there is bad news to it. The fact that our sin has separated us from God. And we have to share that also with individuals that any one of us is guilty. We violated the law according to God, and because of that, we're guilty. And because of that, we need a Savior. Um, hence my shirt. I always try to bring my shirt with the message life. You know, Jesus is our Savior. And again, we turn to him, and we present that gospel, both the good and the bad news. And obviously, the good news outweighs the bad news every time because God provides a way in which we can have a relationship with him. And here, Jeremiah, going back to the passage, is trying to provide a way in which they can get right with the Lord, and they will not. But, this is but his word. He was weary of holding it back, and he could not. It was almost like divine compulsion. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul says something 
something similar. He says, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Um, it was, again, he would relate to Jeremiah that, that it was in his heart, in his bones, and he was weary of holding it back. Um, and I, that's often my prayer when I want to share with individuals, um, you know, that God would kind of give me. And I don't know if you guys get this. It's like the idea that if I don't say something, I won't be able to sleep tonight. If I don't share this, what God's put it on my heart. And I always want God to get me there because I'm always kind of shaky on whether I'm going to share with somebody or not. Uh, this happened for me. And part of when I get to this passage, it brings me back to uh, roughly about 10 and a half years ago when God shared with me that I was to share with my younger brother about salvation. And uh, he took me to a passage in 1 Corinthians 6. And I've shared this with you guys before. But basically God said, you need to ask your, your brother, and his, my, my brother's name's Luke. Um, hence, I got a kid named Luke. And we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But he asked me to share this passage and ask my brother if he's a Christian. And so I asked him, um, and we were pretty close. We were 13 months um, apart in age. Um, he was younger than I. Um, and with that, he asked, uh, God asked me to share this passage with him, uh, 1 Corinthians 6. It basically says, if you practice these things, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, um, and so I shared that with him. Really didn't get a response. Well, basically, I asked him if he was a Christian, and he said, yeah. And I said, well, let me read you this passage. And instead of just referencing the passage, let me read it to you real quick. And it says in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, and there, 9, uh, sorry, it's not 9. Uh, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not de be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And what God was sharing with my brother is it's one thing to call yourself a Christian. It's another thing to live it out. And when I reference this verse, it does not mean to fall to any one of those sins. It's to live that lifestyle and think God's okay with it. God is not okay with those things. He says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And in sharing that with my brother, um, I didn't know what to expect. I shared it with him, kind of left it there. Um, in the meantime, God was doing a work in my brother's life, transforming his life. At that point, he moved out of his girlfriend's house. He, um, he was struggling and kind of the backdrop to that is what really kind of got me to follow the Lord. Um, obviously, it was God drawing me. But the fact that I had led my younger brother into the same lifestyle that I was living. And I had come out. God got me out of that lifestyle. And so I wanted, he was the first one I wanted to bring into a relationship with the Lord. Um, and so I continued to share with him. And this is probably a couple years, four or five years into my walk with the Lord. And that's when I presented this to him, and God started doing a work in his life. And I share that with you because it wasn't um, until about March. Uh, it's kind of funny. I think it might have actually happened 10 years to this day. No. Well, I know um, March 25th is when my brother uh, tragically died in a car accident at age 29. Um, he was on his way home. And uh, got basically went off the road and uh, died. Um, went off the road, got in a car crash, and was found dead. And with that being said, what happened that morning um, is he he went and shared. Well, one of my buddies is a pastor there in Spokane, and he went and shared with his pastor that you know God had been doing this work in his life, and he had one foot in the things of the world and one thing one foot in the things of God, and he wanted two feet in. 
And that morning, he rededicated his life to the Lord. And it was something like eight hours later, he ended up going to be with the Lord. And I share that because when I, yeah, praise the Lord, right? It's just an awesome thing. And God gave me that opportunity to share with him. And I, I tell you that because when I was going to go to, they asked me to do the eulogy. Um, and that's what I got to share. And that's not the only thing that God did in my brother's life. He brought other people. Uh, it, it could be a whole sermon in itself of how God was, God knew my brother's days and when they were going to end. And he put roadblock after roadblock in his life to bring him into a relationship with him. And uh, you need to understand that's what he'll do with any and every person. He's not willing that any should perish. He knows the days that are allotted to each and every one of us. And he'll do anything and everything he can to get you to turn to him. And, and that's what he did with my brother. And when I was going to share, one of my buddies texted me this verse. Because um, I had shared with him a year earlier that you know, I was debating whether I wanted to continue in junior high ministry. Um, it's kind of funny now that I say it because it wasn't as tough as Jeremiah's call. But junior high is it's an awkward age. Um, but I love, I love, I did junior high for 10 years. I love those kids and those kind of things. But I I'd shared this verse and um, with him. And he texted me this verse and he goes, you know, make sure you share, you know, the testimony that God did in your brother's life. And that's what I did at his eulogy. And, you know, because of what God had done through his word in my brother's life and used me to just to see it, to perceive it. And with that, again, that this word became a part of Jeremiah. And so by divine compulsion, he could not hold it back. With a quote, it says, Under the stress and strain of his sufferings, he was tempted to abandon the word, to refuse to speak any more in the name of Jehovah. But when he attempted thus to find release from suffering in silence, it was impossible. For such silence became more intolerable than suffering. And there, Jeremiah could not and would not hold it back. He goes, even though he understood the cost of his calling, he says, many are mocking him. They're using his own message. Remember last year when he kind of, last year, last week, when he prophesied against Pasher, he basically changed his name. He said, you are... Um, prosperity on every side or your freedom on every side. I'm going to change your name to fear on every side. And that's what they said. And they kind of turned back on Jeremiah, the people of Judah, and said, that's all you preach is fear on every side. They're kind of mocking him with his own messages. And not only that, they basically, his acquaintances, his friends, all they're looking for now is to ruin his reputation, to looking for a chance for him to stumble. Um, they knew that if they could invalidate his life or make his life seem unfaithful, that they would ruin the message. And I, I always think of the, the term, if you have friends like this, who needs enemies? Um, because here they are trying to cause him to be stumbled and so with that he turned from his word and the fact that he couldn't hold it back to the confidence and who was calling him in verses 11 and 12 I, I love that term with me as a mighty and awesome one God's might and awe was a greater fact than his pain his greater fact than his humiliation, greater fact than his rejection and his beatings. God became bigger and his misery became smaller. And what he does in this, and this kind of can speak to us, we need to remember the promises that God gives us. All right? And that's, if you just turn to chapter 1, he says, and I think, are probably the most comforting words you can hear from God because he shares them all the time. 
In verse 19, he says, They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you, for I am with you. He shares this with Moses, Abraham, Joshua. The fact that he will never, no never, leave you nor forsake you. That's shared in the book of Hebrews uh, 13, verse 5. That verse, the triple negation, um, just to make and share how powerful that verse is. Uh, I took another version. Uh, I think he's a Greek sc sc scholar. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, he says, of, well, let me read the version that I have here in front of me. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What could man do against me? I like what uh, Wiest does in translates, translating this. He says, for he himself has said, and the statement is on record, I will not, I will not cease to sustain and to hold you. I will not, I will not, I will not let you go. Let you down. Isn't that strong? And that's how it's written in the Greek. It's a triple negation. Um, usually, you know, in math, if you have a negation and a positive, it cancels each other out. It's not how it quite works in, uh, well, even in our grammar, right? Two negations. Double negative is not good, right? Um, I'm trying to think of how it works in our grammar. I obviously. I'm not an English major. I, I, I took business, just to let you know. Um, English has always been the toughest language I've ever learned. Okay, um, with that being said, it's just in the Greek language, um, it's just a strong, emphatic way to say that God will never leave you nor forsake you. And you don't even need that passage. You can just go throughout the calling that he has on individuals' lives, and he will share that with all of them, that he'll never leave you. All right. And um, so we need to remember the promises that God gives us. I often share with ind individuals, when you have and you feel like God has a calling on your life, whether it's to share, whether it's to change. For me, I always share with people, you need to write it down. Um, I had to change careers when I was, well, I got to change careers when I was, 25, 26, God, um, I was, since I was a junior in high school, it was my um, plan to take over my dad's practice as a financial advisor. I went to Eastern. Oh, did you guys watch that Eastern game? The Eagles had a chance to beat Kansas. If you don't know, if you don't watch basketball, uh, my alma mater, as a family, we all filled out the brackets, all my boys. None of them, not even my wife, who's also a graduate of Eastern Washington, she didn't even pick them to win. I picked them to win, and they had, they were leading pretty much three quarters of the whole game, and they lost. Um, so, sorry I had to get that out uh, for Eastern Eagles. Um, they played well. The two brothers, uh, the Groves brothers, they, I think they scored like 58 points. I could give you all the stats. Um, but at the end, an L. Unfortunately, um, all that to tell you, okay, so I went to school to become a financial advisor. I was going to take over my dad's practice, and God had a different path for me. As soon as I um, uh, became a Christian, God was kind of showing me that he was going to um, uh, put me, uh, well, he's going to allow me to be a, become a pastor, those kind of things. And so when I was transitioning and praying about it, I wrote down these scriptures, and I, I would tell you the same thing. Even with, you know, when you're, remember, we're all called to ministry as believers. When you're sharing with individuals, God will give you certain things. Just write them down. And, you know, I had to change careers and then also positions within the ministry. I went from a, a job I loved as far as teaching junior hires um, to singles ministry. For a year, and then from singles ministry, God called me here to Billings, Montana. And I have just a list of verses confirming. And why I tell you that is because um, when things get tough, when there is turmoil, 
and you, you're questioning uh, what you're doing, exactly what you're doing, and um, is this the right thing for you to be doing as far as ministry? You can go back to those verses and know that God gave them to you and confirmed them to you. Um, you know, and, you know, sometimes I have to share with my wife. No, I'm just kidding. She's, she actually confirmed that we we're even moving to Montana. She was first when I asked her about, like, I think God's calling us to Montana. She goes, well, I'm not praying about that. And just to let you know, that's where her heart was first. And then she was the first one on board. Like, yeah, I think God's calling us there. And so, and again, we have verses to back that up. So when things got tough and get tough. And I also would tell you, sometimes you get verses from other people or people share things in your life. And what I was told to do with those is place it on a shelf. And if they came to pass, it was from the Lord. If they didn't, then you could just leave them there. Um, and so even with some of the verses I got, you know, they have still yet to be fulfilled. They're on a, on a shelf. It's waiting. And I don't know if they will be fulfilled or not. But I know, um, one, they're from the Lord, from God. But I don't know if they uh, pertain to me yet. So with that, you just place them on the shelf. And if they come to pass, they're from the Lord. Uh, so the confidence that Jeremiah had was from the Lord. He remembered the promises that he gave him even when he first called him. And he understood that the confidence in who was calling him was, well, the confidence he had is because God is faithful. Um, he says of his persecutors, I will cause your persecutors to stumble. They will not prevail. They'll be ashamed. They're not going to prosper. They'll be confused. And we need to understand that one with God is a majority. If we're in God's will and we're doing the things God has asked us, we're a majority because of who we are following. Um, and I was, you know, as we were worshiping this morning, I, I thought of the passage in John 17. If you could turn that real, real quick. This is the Lord Jesus praying on our behalf, not only for his disciples, but for those who would come to believe in his name. And I just find this comforting in this passage where he shares, um, starting, uh, where do I want to go? Uh, probably verse 13. It says, but now I come to you, and this is what he's sharing with his people that have chosen to follow him. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. If you want to have joy, it only comes in a relationship with Christ. It only can. Yes, we can be happy, but happy is based on circumstances. Joy is something that comes from the Lord. But then he goes on to say, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of this world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. As you sent me into this world, I also have sent them into this world. Now, Jeremiah, this is a prayer. Obviously, 700, well, written 700 years past Jeremiah's ministry, but could apply to Jeremiah's ministry. He had called him into the world. He had called him to share his truth. And share his word. Just like he's called us to do the same. And again, he'll give us the strength. Um, sanctify means to set apart. Um, he says, you know, the world's hated me. They're going to hate you also. I don't know if that's encouraging. But understand you're not. Um, as believers, um, we're going to teach God's word truthfully. And in doing so, it's going to convict people. It's going to hopefully convert people um, to understand that these are words that are eternal. And in grasping these words, they can have a relationship with the Lord. And that's why we share. And again, Jeremiah, going back to Jeremiah, he's trying to get these people to turn. And he goes on to in this passage to 
well, he goes on to continue to pray to the Lord, knowing that his prayer is heard. He says, I pleaded my cause before you. Um, he acknowledges the Lord's power there in verse, what is it? Uh, Lord of hosts, he calls him, kind of the Lord of all armies, um, the God of, oh, sorry, the, yeah, the Lord of hosts. He understands God's power. He acknowledges that it's God who tests the hearts. Um, there's that passage in Genesis 8, 25, shall not the judge of the earth do right? And all he's doing here is sh sharing his confidence he, he has in God, not only that he's all-powerful, that he is the judge, he will do what is right. And even doing so, he, for the sixth time in six prayers, he asks for vengeance on his enemies. And some people can get on Jeremiah for this, but again, he doesn't take matters in his own hands. What God asks us to do is hand those requests over to him. Allow, because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We give them over to him. And I can give you all the passages. And what he does is commits these to him in all of his complaints in his counsels with the Lord or his, uh, what's the thing we, uh, sorry, his confessions to the Lord. And so understand that he's given those things over to the Lord. And also you see unique in verse 15, well, 13, sorry, is his praise for deliverance. And I tell you this, it's unique because what's going to happen, what he's going to say next. But um, what he says in verse 13, sing to the Lord, these are commands, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of the evildoers. And he could be just talking about the fact that he was just taken out of stocks uh, just the day before, or the fact that God was ultimately going to deliver him because that's what God said. He was going to basically keep his ministry until... Um, his ministry was over. And so with that, um, he praises the Lord. And I, and then you get to verses 14 through 18. And, I, and I'm, hopefully all of us can relate. I don't know about you. You've ever been in that moment where you're just having an awesome time with the Lord, singing praises, and then you're driving down the road and somebody cuts you off. And all of a sudden, you are not so prayerful, you're not so praiseworthy, at, at that point you want to take vengeance, you want to do whatever you can to that person. I am not a road rage type of driver, um, necessarily, uh, um, not as bad as other people in my family, um, you can figure it out as, um, because only one other drives, um, but uh, I am not as bad. <laughs> Um, but you guys have all, you know, I've been there where I'm praising the Lord, singing to the top of my lungs, again, by myself. I don't try to injure anybody with my voice. Um, and yet been cut off, and all of a sudden you get in the flesh. And you almost see that transition here uh, with Jeremiah. He's praising the Lord, thanking him for all the ministry he's given him, even though he's given him a hard message, a hard life. <laughs> and he's praising the Lord. And all of a sudden, um, he loses perspective. His focus comes off of God, and he looks to his circumstances. And you see this throughout the Bible, from his exaltation to grief. And let me read these verses real quick, um, in verses 14 through 18. So these are kind of dire verses. It says, Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you, making him very glad. And let that man be like the cities, which the Lord overthrew and did not relent. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon, because he did not kill me from the womb. Let my mother, that my mother might have been my grave, and her womb always enlarged with me. Why did I come forth from the womb? to see labor and sorrow, that my days should be consumed with shame. Pretty dire, right? Pretty, And you see the despair in his calling. He goes from 
praising the Lord to deep despair, to the fact that he was cursing his birth. And he's not the only one. Um, Job does it. And we know what happened to Job, where he loses 10 of his children, his wealth, and even sickness is put on him. Job 3 is the passage. Elijah, right after he does that great miracle with the prophets of Baal, um, he then goes in hiding because Jezebel threatens his life. And in doing so, he asks the Lord to take his life. Um, Elijah does this. Jonah does it three different times in the book of Jonah. First time he's like, Lord, I'm not going to do what you're asking me to do. I do not want to go preach to those people. They're a bad people. And they were. Assyria was known for its hostility towards its captives and towards people in general. And he did not want to preach that gospel. And so as he's going away from that place, he asks the seamen because of the storm, knowing that it's from God, he has to be thrown overboard. And not only that, after he does the greatest evangelical message in the fact that he goes and presents something like nine words, eight or nine words he shares with his people. Basically, repent or you're going to die in 40 days. And this whole city turns back to the Lord, um, Nineveh. And in doing so, at that point, he then goes to the Lord and goes, kill me now. I don't want to be alive to see this repentance um, from this people. And, and then also, it goes from that extreme to the trivial. He basically has provided some shade because of the scorching heat. And that shade gets eaten by a worm. And when that worm dies, he basically goes, Lord, kill me now. I don't, you know, this shade that you just provided is gone. And all that to share that Jeremiah is not the only one that um, curses the day that he was born. He not only curses the day that he was born, he curses the messenger that brought the news that he was going to be born. And notice he didn't talk to his, they talk about his parents. Some commentary said, one commentary said basically it was a violation to curse your own parents. Um, you break one of the commandments. So even in his despair, he's not going to violate commandments. Yet he does want to curse the messenger that brought the news. He says, treat him like the cities that you overthrew, like Sodom. And he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. Treat this messenger. Like, kill the messenger. Um, let him hear the cry. And that's the idea of a siege taking place. Let him experience that so he will not bring this message of my birth. So, again, great despair. He says, even... Curse the time that I've spent in the womb. He asked the idea of, Lord, why didn't you just kill me in the womb instead of having to go through this? And you see, as dire as this message is, uh, you see this also in Solomon's heart when he writes in Ecclesiastes. He says, again, I observed all the oppression that takes place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed. With no one to comfort them, the oppressors have great power and the victims are helpless. So I concluded that the dead are better off than the living. But most fortunate of all of those who are not yet born, for they have not seen all the evil that is done under the sun. That's pretty dark also. And we know the book of Ecclesiastes is written from a perspective where Solomon's in a bad place with the Lord. Towards the end of his ministry, he thinks there's nothing worth living for. Um, He's gone after everything that's provided under the sun, and yet it does not fulfill him. And what he says at the end is, man's all is to do what God asks him to do and obey his commandments. Um, um, with that, this message, the idea that he's cursing the time spent in the womb, Jeremiah again shows his despair. And with that, let me read this quotation. There was a purpose of God in setting this section of grief immediately after the section of faith and triumph to show that trusting God did not make it all easy or triumphant for Jeremiah. The battle remained, and reliance upon God has to be constant. So there is a message learned in this past passage. 
He says, let me not be consumed with shame. The idea that I want to continue sharing this message with this people that will not avoid the destruction. Um, just trying to figure out what way to go right here. Um, real quick. So with that, I want to do two things at the end of this passage. One, to tell you that this is Jeremiah's last confession, last complaint that he has. And it's not the last hard thing that he goes through. He's later imprisoned in chapter 37. He's later thrown in a cistern in chapter 38. He's actually forced to leave to Egypt at one point in chapter 43. Um, and what you learn here is his complaints end here. God did a work in Jeremiah's life. You do not see the confession. We don't also see the rebuke as we do in other complaints. And what God did in Jeremiah's life is he became the calling that God had on his life. He became that calling. In Jeremiah 1.18, he says to him, he says, For behold, I have made you this day. God is the one responsible for Jeremiah and for every one of us sitting here. He says, For I, behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against his priests, and against the people of this land. In doing so, God shared with him that there is a purpose that I have in your calling. I'm giving you the strength to stand against this whole land and not be overcome by your enemies. And Jeremiah learned, as many others have, that testing, even severe testing, may be the most effective means of strengthening one's faith. And how important is that faith? Peter says it's more important than gold, all the money in the world. Because our relationship with Christ changes our eternity. If we've accepted God and gone after Him, He not only saves us, He gives us a life. He has a calling in our life. But we also get to spend eternity with Him. And, well, let me read First Peter. It says, These trials which show that your faith these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Again, your faith is the most precious thing that God wants to... Well, it's what bridges... Uh, basically what's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever is the trust that we place in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And in closing, he asks a question. He says, Jeremiah says, why did I come forth? And we have the answer as believers. We have the answer. I read Psalm 139 that the Bible says, Psalm 139 is a great passage. It says, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And he's talking about each and every individual. Um, he told Jeremiah, you were made to be a prophet to these nations. That's why I was going to make you a fortified city, an iron, iron bronze. You're going to have a forehead of flint what he said to Ezekiel. You're just going to have to have a hard forehead because of all the stuff that's coming your way. So he was specific with Jeremiah. But he's also specific with us. Again, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. We have the answer of why we, we are here. Right? Um, we are to know God and to make him known. We are to know God and make him known. 
um, if we could all turn to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. says, for by grace, start in verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. And this gift is given to each and every one of us. It's provided for each and every one of us. All of us have had, hopefully all of us have had, have had a present under the tree at Christmas time. Specifically, God has a present with your name on it, under the Christmas tree. And what he's asking for you is to receive that gift, to open that gift. It has your name on it. And he's created us to know God. And it's by his grace, not based on what you're going to do for him. Grace is the idea of unmerited favor. He has this gift ready for you to accept. And by his grace, if you accept it, the Bible says you will be saved. You can have a relationship with him. And he goes on to say, not of works. Well, I just shared that. Not of works. It's not based on what you're going to do for him or what you've done for him or um, any of that. It's not based on what you do, but what he has done for you already. That's the good news. We're guilty, but he has provided a way in which we can have a relationship with him. He then goes on to say, not of works, lest any one should boast. For we, this is his purpose, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. And I love that because that shares with each and every one of us that he has a plan and purpose in your life. One, first, it's to know him. That's the first thing. He wants you to have a relationship with him. And then he will start to show you the ministry that he has for every believer and for every individual. God said in Romans 5, but God demonstrates his love for us that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It goes on to say in 2 Peter 3, 9, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come. Well, gosh, I'm Butchering that. Sorry. Second Peter 3 9. It's funny. I can quote this to my kids. I can't quote it now. <laughs> Second Peter 3 9. Uh, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So why did I come forth? Again, it's to know God and to be known and to make him known. It's by grace. And if you're hearing the, my voice um, and have not, put your trust in the Lord. And how we share it here is um, you need to recognize that you're a sinner. And that your sin has separated you from Christ, from God. But the good news is God's provided a way through his death, burial, burial, and resurrection for you to have a relationship with him. But the Bible says you need to receive that. Just like that present that's underneath a tree. You need to take it. It has your name already written on it for you to open. How silly. And unfortunately, we have a lot of silly individuals that still have that present underneath the tree with their name wrapped up and have not opened it. But God's provided that for each and every one of us. And if we would take that gift, we would receive God. He said he would come into your life. You would become a believer. And doing so, then he will share with you your calling. And um, he has a calling for each one of us. And it's to make him known by not only the words that we share with others, but how we live our life and how God will transform 
my life, um, I don't deserve any of it. And yet God has blessed my life with three boys, with a wife that loves the Lord, with a ministry to share God's word. And again, I don't deserve any of it. But he continues to pour into my life. He, God will never be your debtor. You're going to realize that. Uh, you can't outgive God. And what God wants to do is start with a relationship with you, with everybody here. And I share this because what I'm going to do is as I'm going to pray, I'm going to ask if anyone in this room has not accepted the Lord, that they would raise their hand if they want that relationship with the Lord. And as I'm praying with believers also praying with me, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you have not made that decision. And if you want to follow the Lord, just raise your hand. And in doing so, after I'm done with my prayer, I'll ask you to stand up if you've raised your hand. And I'm warning you this, right, because the Bible says, if you will not confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. And so I'll ask you to stand up. And if you stand up, then I'll lead you in a prayer asking the Lord to come into your life. And in doing so, it's not the magic words that I give you that gives you that relationship. It's God seeing your heart, realizing it's He that will save you. And in doing so, then these nice people in this room who are believers will clap for you, and you will be part of the family of God. And so... Let me pray. Uh, Lord, again, thank you. Thank you, Lord, um, for what you do for each and every one of us. Lord, I still remember um, asking you to come into my life. And my world has been rocked. It's been changed ever since. And I just thank you for that. And I know believers around here can share the same thing. You do things that just we never can earn, we never deserve, yet because of your love for each and every one of us. Lord, so I ask for those around us who have not made that confession, have not asked for you to come into their lives, that you would give them the strength, the boldness to raise their hand. Lord, so if there is anyone in this room who has not, Ask the Lord Jesus to come into the life. I'd ask that you would raise your hand now. Anybody? Awesome. Praise the Lord right there. Anybody else? Just a moment. Awesome.